<laughs> you're fairly familiar with waves. Um, when I go back to your what do you know, you had a lot to say about waves. You said, yeah, there's more than one kind. And a lot of you, do you want to go back to what you said for your what do you know? Because it's been a while. Hold on. Some of the things that I remember you guys saying, a lot of you did say, yeah, there's more than one kind of wave. I don't remember what, which is fine. That's pretty common. Um, waves move energy was another thing that I remember somebody said. And then a lot of other people kind of said, eh, I don't remember. It's been a while. Because the last time you talked about this was probably your freshman year in physical science, which is like four lifetimes ago when you're 18. Okay, but a wave is just, it's the motion of a disturbance. That's all it is. It's the movement of a disturbance through some medium. In general, the waves that we're talking about do require a medium. So you know I have to play this game, right? We've got more rows this way. What are we going to do? We're going to do, do the wave. Of course we are. Don't be silly. It's Friday. It's beautiful. So we'll start the wave up here. Kaylee will be our little groundbreaker. Or we can start it from back there. Okay. We'll start it from back here. Ryan and Tomas will be our, our um, wave pattern. Now, you might want to turn fa to face this wall so that you all get to see the wave in action. Wait, I can't see it. That human wave was a disturbance in what medium? What was the medium for the wave? Human flesh. You! Say people. People! Yes! <laughs> That wave was people! You don't even get the silent green reference. Okay. Um, so, that was a mechanical wave. Mechanical waves require a medium through which they can move. That was a mechanical wave. This whoops, is a mechanical wave moving through what medium? The spring. So, there we go. You are hearing a mechanical wave moving through a medium. What is it? What's the medium? Air. Air. There is no sound in a vacuum. Because there is no one can hear you scream in space. That's right. Um, <laughs> just your creepy little thought for a Friday. Um, yeah, if there's no <coughs> air, there's no sound. Because sound is a disturbance of the air. Um, there is one exception to this whole waves need a medium, and that is a kind of wave that you are um, perceiving right now. Light. Light, because light is an electromagnetic wave. This is incredibly lucky for us. Where does the beautiful light out there come from? Sun. The sun. Where does that light travel through? Space. The void of space where no one can hear you scream. So if electromagnetic radiation, electromagnetic waves could not travel through a medium-less environment, well, we wouldn't be having this conversation. <laughs> um, we just wouldn't. Because there'd be no energy from the sun coming to Earth. So um, mechanical waves are everything except electromagnetic. So a couple different types of waves, and you replicated some of these in the lab. A pulse wave is that single traveling pulse. You flicked the end and it went whoop. and if you had just stopped it right there that is a pulse wave, single traveling wave and, and you got some wave reflection and we'll talk about reflection later. A periodic wave is when you stand there and you do that with the end. So you have a series of pulses that are all traveling through the same medium. Um, has anybody seen a periodic wave form in nature? Yeah, ocean waves are a periodic waveform. Um, you know, if you stand with your toes at the edge of Guilford or some small lake or pond, and there are little ripples that lap the shore, those are a periodic wave. You have periodic disturbances that are traveling through the medium of the water and reaching the shore at periodic intervals. Um, the periodic disturbance is very often, in that case, wind. So, sine waves. And this is where I really, do you remember the big um, wave machine that we had? Mm. I know. Some of you are very disappointed that we don't have it anymore. Um, it was old and battered, and we were being yelled at to not move stuff, so it went away. Um, but I really miss it right now. <laughs> we could build one for, let me think about that. Um, so 
A sine wave, how many of you have you hand graphed a sine wave? You do this, right? They make you do this? Good. So a sine wave is a periodic wave, but it's a very special periodic wave. Um, and of course, it is the graph of a sine function. The source of the disturbance has a simple harmonic motion. What is simple harmonic motion? No, Moza, that was like a week and a half ago. There's been a lot of flower between now and then. A lot of flower under the bridge. Simple harmonic motion has restoring force that is what? Pro proportional. Proportional to the <laughs> disturbance? Here, let's look. Can't find the slide. So yeah, simple harmonic motion has a restoring force that is proportional to the disturbance. So here the disturbance has simple harmonic motion. So it's some form of disturbance that is simple harmonic. Okay. And therefore every single point in that wave has simple harmonic motion. Talk about two kinds of mechanical waves, and the first one is the transverse. This is what you think of when you think of a wave. This is the classic wave. Um, you've got, and, and this is a sine wave. Okay, you have amplitude being, and this is really important. Amplitude is not the height of the wave. Amplitude is only the distance of the disturbance from equilibrium to the extreme point of disturbance. So on our pendulum, and of course we lost our mass for our pendulum, let me restore that. So on our pendulum we said that our point out here, our maximum deformation from equilibrium, the measurement from equilibrium out to maximum deformation was the amplitude of the motion. Here the amplitude of the motion, because this is your equilibrium point, is the distance between equilibrium and the maximum deformation of the particle. Okay. Um, wavelength is either trough to trough or crest to crest, or can it be equilibrium to equilibrium? No. <laughs> Trick question, but everybody wants to say yes. So a wavelength is where you've gone through one entire cycle of motion. So let's look at what a, a wavelength actually encompasses. If we're going from trough to trough, we go trough, up to equilibrium, up to a crest, down to equilibrium, down to a trough. That's an entire cycle of motion. We're back where we started. If we go from equilibrium to the next equilibrium, we go up through the crest and down to equilibrium. Is that an entire cycle of motion? No. And that's the tricky part. If you're using wavelength from equilibrium position to equilibrium position, you have to go through actually the equilibrium position twice to get an entire cycle of motion. Okay. Yeah. Because otherwise you're only getting half a cycle of motion. You're getting a half a wavelength. Okay. We measure wavelength and we call it lambda, and it's commonly just measured in meters. Um, now you can have meter. You can have waves that have very tiny wavelengths. You can have nanometer um, long waves. Can anybody think? of a nanometer length wave, your baby is. Lasers. Well, light. Light in general, lasers specifically, yes. So the light, visible light spectrum, light you can see on the electromagnetic radiation um, spectrum, has wavelengths from 450 nanometers to 650 nanometers. They're little teeny. And I always get this, okay, blue is... Mm, no, see, I'm, I'd have to look it up. I always, I always forget this. I have to look it up every year. Um, I have to look it up. I can't, I can't. Uh, but yeah, those are tiny little waves. I mean, think about a centimeter. Now think about a millimeter. Now try to put your fingers any closer together. You can't. So these are waves that have wavelengths that we can't even perceive. Um, Elephants, who knows anything about elephants? They're amazing, they're cool, they have very long memories, they have they complicated emotional lives, they what? They go off and die 
they, they go off and die, not by themselves. No, elephants have a very complicated social structure surrounding death, and other elements have, elephants have been seen to rub the bones of elephants they've known and lay with their bodies. I mean, they have a complicated emotional life. Yeah, elephants are cool. Elephants, that's not why I'm talking about them right now, though it's all true. The reason I'm talking about them right now is elephants do something that is called, okay, I'm going to get this wrong because I always do. Well, it's, basically, it's ultra-low frequency communication. So they make noises. So the range of human hearing, and we don't do the sound chapter anymore, but human hearing is a mechanical wave, or human sound is a mechanical wave. Human hearing perceives mechanical waves that have certain frequencies. And the range of human hearing is typically given as 20 cycles per second is the low end to 20,000 cycles per second. So when they talk about dog whistles, a, a, a whistle so high that you can't hear it but your dog can, dogs have a different hearing range than we do. Elephants do ultra subsonic communication. It is very low frequency. The, way, the length of each individual wave is, multi, is meters upon meters upon meters long. There are these incredibly long wavelength sound vibrations. And they travel very nicely in the elephant's environment. And they can communicate with other elephants over miles. How do we know that? It's a great question. I'm not sure. I mean, biologists have, have tracked. They, they, they used to know that elephants, it was evident from some behaviors that there seemed to be long-distance communication going on. And, I mean, you can build a device which will sense sounds that are below the range of human hearing and above the range of human hearing. Um, sonar is a device that hears, basically hears sound vibration that is well above the range of human hearing. You can't hear radar, but you can see it, and, and it's just a sound wave. It's a sound wave being sent out that's way above your hearing range. We can also build a detector for low range sound. So I don't know exactly how they figured it out, but they did. Okay. And so just knowing the parts of a mechanical wave, pretty important. But there's one more thing that's important. Okay, sorry, before we get to the maths, which, you know, I get all excited about. Um, the other kind of mechanical wave is the longitudinal wave, and this is the slinky wave. That's how everybody remembers it. Uh, when I used to teach physical science, that's how I taught it. It's a slinky wave. Um, we do sometimes call it a compression wave, and I tend to favor that. They... They are sometimes called density waves or pressure waves. I don't usually refer to them that way. Um, the pressure wave you may have heard about in a medical slash military context. Have you heard about pressure waves in a medical or military context? No? Anybody heard discussion about TBIs? What's a TBI? And actually, we talk about TBIs in, in a lot of other contexts these days. We used to just say, you know, yeah, so-and-so got their bell rung, um, so-and-so got guardrail poisoning. But TBI is a traumatic brain injury. I, I went to college with a guy who I, I knew him after the accident, and I never saw why anybody was friends with him because he was just really abrasive and a real jerk. And people who had known him before the accident, motorcycle accident, um, said, well, yeah, John... That's not who John was, you know. He had had a traumatic brain injury, had a serious personality shift, and had become this really kind of nasty, abrasive guy. Because um, your brain is who you are. Protect, protect the box of bone on the top of your neck. Um, but a pressure wave is something we hear a lot about currently um, with improvised explosive devices and military personnel who have been near explosions. So you can be near an explosion, very near, and not have a physical, visible bodily injury. And this is the same, in a, I mean, in a context, like if you're next to something that goes boom, not like a potato gun, but a serious explosion. The pressure wave is the air compression that comes off of that exploding thing. Well, that pressure wave passes through your body. And if you've ever felt, if you've ever been near enough something to feel, you know, okay, I'll tell you that um, my grandpa used to like to light bonfires with a lot of kerosene. Um, as a little kid, I thought it was the best thing ever because you got the woof. 
and sometimes when he used a real lot, you, it almost felt like you could feel the air push back at you when they let me get close enough. Um, that's a pressure wave. That's this wave front coming off of a rapidly um, changing volume gas. So one of the things they found, especially with, uh, and the TBI they have said is like the signature injury of um, current military personnel or one of them, that pressure wave can pass through your skull and pass through your brain, and it can do a whole lot of damage to your brain even though your skull is not broken, there's no visible injury, you're not bloody, you, don't, you aren't missing limbs, but you still have this brain injury from, from actually just compressed air. Because as, as those compressed air particles strike your body, they exert a force on the particles of your body, and the particles of your skull exert a for force on the particles of your brain, and it goes right out the other side of you. Yeah? Is it like a form of torture? Well, it's... I probably, I don't know. Ew. Um, okay. Um, I mean, directing high intensity sound at people. There, there were some experiments, some, you know, what I'll call pretty nasty, pretty shady government experiments at various points in the past with using directed sound waves at crowds for crowd control. And you see this sometimes in movies. Like everybody suddenly falls to the ground going, ah! um, covering their ears. And it's because very often they're directing high frequency sound at them, or you can get a parabolic reflector and reflect sound waves at somebody. Um, I don't know about torture, but I know crowd control, yes. So. Can you like, see that on like, testing and stuff? Like, is it visible? Um, you know? No. Well, define. You know what I mean? Like, medical testing. Like, Could you see the damage from something yeah, like that? Like, from it. a TBI, yes, because there's brain swelling. Oh, okay. um, because it's, it's like getting punched in the head except you're getting punched in the head with air. So, um, you know, boxers uh, and, and football players are now finding um, chronic, what is it, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, um, CTE, and they're finding, like, you know, repeated blows to the head, <laughs> duh, really damage your brain. Um, and, like Muhammad Ali had Parkinson-like syndromes, I don't know how old he was, and it was probably because of getting punched in the head for many years. Um, so this is rather than like a bunch of smaller punches, something like a, a pressure wave TBI is like one gigantic punch. So yeah, after something like that, you do have brain swelling. Um, and if anybody here knows anybody who's had a TBI, um, had a really, like I have my, my uncle who's now deceased, but um, was in a motorcycle accident at 19. <laughs> this was in 19... I don't know what, 50 something. He was wearing a helmet at that time in history. Do you know what a motorcycle helmet was? It was a leather cap with a chin strap. And he, Tea Garden Road between uh, Franklin Square and Guilford Lake, um, he was in a coma for a week. He was unconscious for a week. They didn't expect him to live. TBI. Um, when you have something that strikes the skull, the brain tends to swell. Um, now one of the things they very often do is they will actually remove a portion of the skull. They'll cut out a portion of the skull to allow the brain to swell. And then they, they, re, they put the cap back in. <laughs> um, because if the brain swells against the skull, it causes further damage. So the goal is to allow the brain to, I mean, you know, you've all gotten a goose egg at some point, right? You've fallen down, you've gotten hit, you've gotten bumped, you've gotten a lump. Well, that lump is inflammation and it swells, it expands, and it goes back down. You want to allow the brain to do that without further damaging itself by pushing up against the skull and creating additional pressure, and then they can have a stroke because you've got, you know, all this pressure inside this contained area. So anyway, that was that whole long conversation brought to you by the concept of pressure waves. Um, these compression waves, sound is a compression wave. And it's not the only kind of compression wave, but it's, it's one. In place of talking about crests and troughs, it's so hard for me to say those two things, um, with compression waves, we talk about rare, rarefactions and compressions. So these areas where it's expanded are rarefactions. And I always want to say rarefactions. No, it's rarefactions or rarefactions. And the areas where it's squished together are the compressions. And guess what? We can measure wavelength the same way. 
So if you wanted to measure wavelength on a compression wave, you can measure from the start of one compression to the start of another compression. You can measure from the start of one rarefaction to the start of the next. You can get all crazy and measure from, you know, some other point to some other point. Ah! Why would you make it so hard on yourself? But the big deal is that wavelength is just one full cycle of motion. Period. You're really going to like this math. <laughs> You're going to love this math. It's three-part algebra. It couldn't be a whole lot easier. So the velocity of any wave is the, is the product of its frequency and its wavelength. So if wavelength goes up, what happens to frequency? It goes down. down. They're inversely proportional. So a longer wavelength means a lower frequency. Remember, frequency is how often a wave passes a given point. You can think about it if you think about a telephone pole stuck out in the middle of the ocean or out near shore like dock pilings. Um, how often the wave strikes that is its frequency. Lots of little waves strike that more often. Big, long waves strike it less frequently. So it's lower frequency, longer wavelength, shorter wavelength, higher frequency. Um, in any given medium, if you don't change mediums, the wave's speed remains constant. That's an important clarification, because when you change mediums, the wave speed does in fact change. If you look at page 457, if you've got a book, if you don't, don't worry about it. We're going to do a quick practice problem, and then all the 4D problems will be assigned. Piano string tuned to middle C vibrates with a frequency of 264 hertz. That means 264 times in one second, 264 cycles per second. Assuming that the speed of sound in air is 343 meters per second, what is the wavelength of those sound waves that are produced by the string? So um, we won't get to talk a whole lot about the speed of sound in air, but it's typically given as somewhere around 345 meters per second in general. Here they're saying 345. So what we have is that the velocity of the wave equals... F lambda, frequency lambda. We're given velocity, we're given frequency, we're solving for lambda. So V over F equals lambda. Did I mention that you're going to like these? 364 meters per second divided by 264 hertz. Pardon my screw up, that should be 343. I was so excited about 64 for some unknown reason that I just wanted to keep repeating it. We get a raw answer of 1.2992424, on and on and on. What are our units here? Meters. Meters. Now, so we, we end up with 1.30 meters is our lambda. But does that work out from a dimensional analysis standpoint? What the heck are hertz? Cycles per second, and we typically show hertz as we can. Um, whoops, <coughs> we can show hertz as one, one over seconds. One over seconds. And so Invert and multiply. One to one meter. Yeah, so you get one meter. So, um, questions, comments, concerns. I think you could all do this. Like, like, have you could let a chimpanzee do these for you, basically. If you have a chimp at home and you'd like to give them something to do, give them the 12D problems and this should keep them entertained for an hour or so. Then you're going to have to find something else, because if you don't give the chimps something to do, they will be destructive. Um, chimps can learn sign language. <laughs> that was awesome. Okay, so 12D, all problems assigned.